Hey, welcome back guys, Jaylan Bio here for another exclusive video. Before I start this video, make sure you like, subscribe, shop merch, all that good stuff. Uh, really helps with the internet bills, really helps with the boat payment, so I really appreciate you guys taking care of that for me. Hey, today we're going to focus on solids, liquids, and gases. Enough said, let's get going. Today you should be able to differentiate between solids, liquids, and gases on a molecular level, and also be able to analyze a variety of properties that are related to solids, liquids, and gases. So a lot of the stuff you probably should already be aware of, but I'm just going to review it anyways. States of matter includes things like solids, liquids, and gases. Solid molecules vibrate in place, are very close together, have high intermolecular forces, are rarely compressible, and have definite shape and volume. Liquid molecules are spread for slightly further apart. They flow over each other and are somewhat close together. In fact, solids and liquids actually typically have the same molar volume, as well as having the same intermolecular forces that are present. They're rarely compressible and have a definite volume, but no definite shape. They take the shape of the container you put them in. Gas molecules are very far apart. They rarely interact and have very small or no intermolecular forces. They are compressible, like propane. <laughs> I'm Hank Hill, and I sell propane and propane accessories. <sighs> Love it. They're compressible as well. Oh, we already talked about that. And they have an indefinite volume and shape. So properties of solids are determined by the strengths and types of forces that are present. Now, intermolecular forces between different molecules are broken when a substance is vaporized, melted, or boiled. So things like vapor pressure, melting point, and boiling point are all directly related to the intermolecular forces that are present. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the stronger that those atoms or molecules are held together, and therefore the more difficult it is to melt it or boil it to change its state. So as you see here in the diagrams, the weaker intermolecular forces have lower boiling points and lower melting points, meaning that it's easier for them to be converted into a liquid and into a gas. The higher the intermolecular forces that are present, the closer those atoms are, the more forces that are between them, the harder it is to break those molecules off and have them become a gas. So as a result, the higher intermolecular forces means higher boiling point, higher melting point. For vapor pressure, though, remember it is the opposite. The lower intermolecular forces have a higher vapor pressure. Reason for that is that those molecules become a vapor much easier than other molecules. The easier it becomes a vapor, the more pressure that that vapor would have on the inside of a container that is rigid. So vapor pressure is indirectly related to intermolecular forces. The stronger the forces, the weaker the vapor pressure. The weaker the vapor the weak force, weaker the forces, the stronger the vapor pressure. Now ionic solids, much like other solids, tend to have low vapor pressures and high melting points and boiling points due to strong interactions that occur between the ions. Remember that those atoms are packed very, very, very tightly into that three-dimensional structure. And so as a result, it's very, very difficult to remove them because they have very strong positive and negative interactions between the ions. Ionic solids are very brittle. They will break if you move them because the atoms will repel. And they're also very poor conductors of electricity because the ions are in a fixed position. Now, if they're dissolved in water or melted, that mobilizes the ions and allows the current to run through. We've already discussed this. Covalent network solids are a bit different than covalently bonded compounds. These form networks, very similar to ionic solids. So for an example of this would be carbon. Carbon can form diamond or graphite. Diamond is in the three-dimensional network, and graphite is in the two-dimensional network. Because they are covalent network solids, uh, they are nonmetals. If you take a look at diamond, for example, the strong covalent interactions means that they have very high melting points. So diamond forms a three-dimensional structure, while graphite forms 2D. The 3D network is very rigid and hard since all the bond angles are fixed, which explains the explicit hardness of diamond. Two-dimensional networks are usually in layers, which can easily glide past each other, which makes graphite very, very useful for writing, because those layers glide past each other and are easily glided on a piece of paper. Now, molecular covalent solids, which are a little bit different than the network solids, are made up of individual units of covalently bonded molecules that are attracted through relatively weak intermolecular forces. Now, when I refer to weak intermolecular forces, I mean relative to ionic. Obviously, hydrogen bonding can do some really cool things. 
dipole dipole and London forces are also very very useful for the molecules as well but we need to make sure that we take into consideration the fact that those ionic solids have a much much stronger force in between them than the covalent ones they have a very low melting point due to weak intermolecular forces and there is no conduction of electricity because the electrons are held tightly through the covalent bonds even lone pairs are very tightly held to the atoms themselves and this can be very very large biomolecules as well that are hundreds even thousands of atoms in length Metallic solids is something we've already discussed as well. These are good conductors of heat and electricity due to the sea of delocalized valence electrons, which makes them valuable and ductile. When we make alloys, the purpose of making alloys is to actually make them stronger. What happens is that the atoms that are located in between the atoms of metal actually make the metal more rigid. There's less room for those metal atoms to be able to move around if there's other atoms that are in between the metal ones. So that tends to make metal more rigid as an interstitial alloy. Now large biomolecules can have a variety of interactions. If you take a look here, number three on this phospholipid is very, very nonpolar. Two slightly polar and one is very polar. So as a result, large biomolecules can have a variety of different polarities. And this plays a huge role in the type of intermolecular forces that are made, the shape of the molecule, as well as its biological function. Hopefully you remember that phospholipids play a really important part in the cell membrane as part of the phospholipid bilayer. The last thing I want to go through very, very briefly is that liquid phases and solid phases have actually very similar molar volumes, as both phases and the particles are relatively close in contact. They have very similar intermolecular forces, and as a result, take up a very similar amount of space. So they're gonna have very similar molar volumes because the space between the molecules and solids and liquids is pretty much the same. Hopefully you have the learning objectives for today. I'm Jay Lamb Bio. Again, make sure you like, subscribe, shop merch, and get a hold of me, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.